Well, I hope that God has spoken to you as much as He's spoken to me through these four songs. And I want to go back to actually the very first song that we sung was Yes and Amen. And there's a phrase in it that says, I will rest in your promises. What I'd like to invite you to do is bow your head and close your eyes with me. And I'd like for you just to pause and don't think about anything except what Jesus has done for us. And if you need to do some uh, physical breathing exercises right now because of all the stuff that is going on, it's okay. Because we can meditate on Jesus. And we can rest on the promises of God that He's given to us. The song earlier, just before this last one was sung, there, there's a phrase in it, you know just what we need before we say a word. God knows what we're going through. He knows all about this COVID-19 crisis. He knows about your specific need, whether you're sick and feel horrible, you're stressed about finances and maybe kids or parents. God knows exactly what's on your mind. He knows your anxious thought. And He cares exactly where you're at. So let's pray together. Father, we come to You right now. First of all, thanking You that we can rest and our rest will be beneficial, it will be healing, it will be focused when our rest is in you and not in anything else. Father, I thank you that you know exactly what we need before the words come out of our mouths. You are a good, good Father. By giving us your son, Jesus. We just sang the song, Oh, that that wonderful cross. It's rugged. It was beaten. Jesus was beaten on it. Yet, it is beautiful in our sight because of what Jesus has done for us. We can come to you and lift up these songs out of praise because of our relationship. So, Father, thank you. You know what people are going through right now in Port Aransas and around the world. So, Father, I ask for healing, and I ask that you would put an end to this virus. Father, even more than those things, I pray that you would do what you want to do through this. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for joining us, our praise team. That was exactly what I needed. I I believe it was more than just me who needed all that. Well, I'm so glad that you're joining us this morning. This is a special time where we can come together and focus on our Father. We are back in 1 Timothy today in our series in search of church. If you have not had a chance to go back to last week's in 1 Timothy chapter 2, 1 through 7, I invite you to do that sooner rather than later uh, because that really is the context in which we find ourselves uh, today because Paul tells us that he wants everyone to pray for all people, but not just because it's a good thing to do, but rather to pray so that they will be saved. And so that is really the context of where we're at. Paul tells us to pray uh, last week. Now, today he's going to tell us specifically how to pray, and he's going to break it down into gender, how to pray. But I want you to not get caught up in the cultural aspect that we're going to address, but I want you to understand the heart. There's something that is really important for us to grasp in all of this, And it's that we understand the context, the cultural context. Paul is writing to a specific culture, 
And so we want to understand that culture without imposing our own culture on Scripture. And that's one thing that we have to be careful of because culture changes. And what's right in one culture will be completely turned upside down in another culture. So we don't want to impose our own cultural values, but we want to look at what God is saying through the culture because culture changes, God doesn't. And that's one thing we can hold on to. So as you can see, I'm prepping you for today uh, because over the next three weeks, I'm going to have an opportunity to offend probably everybody that's listening. Or maybe a better way to put it is, you will have the opportunity to be offended. Uh, and so hold on, your, your chance is coming up, but I hope and I plan that we will get to look at the context and we'll look at Scripture and see that God has a purpose in this. So whether it dings us a little bit, maybe we need to go to the Father and say, okay, God, why, why am I bent out of shape about this? Why, why does this ding my soul just a little bit, ding my conscience a little bit? And maybe the Father has something for us through all of this. And I believe that today we're going to have a better understanding of God's Word. So ladies, today will probably be your day first to be offended, but I don't think you have to be offended. Hang with me as we go through this. There is a cultural context, yet there's something that we all can glean out. past two weeks, we've seen how God is glorified in saving sinners and Christians praying for sinners to be saved. Now, Jewish Christians at this time when Paul wrote this and when they read this, they would have known David's prayer to God in Psalm chapter 139, 23 through 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any grievous way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. Now, Paul is not using these words. He's not even referring to this in his letter that we're going to read in just a moment. But I believe that it is something like this that is at the heart of what Paul is trying to say. He's wanting both men and women to ask the Father to search their heart. So that's where we're going to be going here today. Paul's greater point is God is glorified when our heart's motivation is to humbly honor the Father. The difference in Christianity and all other religions is that other religions try to get a person to act in a way to get a response from God. But we don't have to do that because Jesus has already acted. So Christianity, and Jesus has already acted, Christianity tells us, Jesus tells us, that because he's already acted, we can respond out of gratitude. And God has already loved us. He's a good, good father. So we are back in 1 Timothy, chapter 2, verses 8 through 15. I desire then that in every place the men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. Hmm. Wow, there could be a whole sermon right there. Verse 9. Likewise, also that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel, with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire, but with what is proper for women who profess godliness. So let me just get your thoughts here, ladies. Paul is talking to Christian women, saying if you profess godliness, there is an attitude of the heart to hold on to. So he continues in verse 10, with good work. So let me read verse 10 again. But with what is proper for women who profess godliness, with good works. So God comes out of us, Jesus comes out of us because he's already there. We profess godliness, we allow Jesus to work in us, and then the works show that. Let a woman, verse 11, let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. 
I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. Hold on, ladies. Don't let your hair light up on fire just yet. Hold on. Verse 13. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet she will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. So there's a lot here. So ladies, are you still with me? Okay, hang on. So before we get to the ladies, though, verse 8. I desire then that in every place the men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. So remember, in last week's verses that we read, Paul says, I desire for all people to pray for all people so that they are saved. And I'm paraphrasing that. So this is a continuation of the prayer topic and specifically corporate prayer and worship. What we do together when we meet. And boy, I cannot wait for that to happen. Unfortunately, it's not today. It's not going to be next week either. So let's just continue to pray, and let's pray for God to do what He wants to do through all of this. But this is a continuation of uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, 1 through 7. It's a topic on prayer, and now Paul is getting practical with the Ephesian church, with the situation and culture that they were in. So men, we've been called out and called to attention. Paul specifically encourages men to pray in a posture that is a posture of humility. Now, I want you to think of a child reaching up to their father saying, Daddy, hold me. This is actually one of the things I miss about having younger children. Now, my youngest is 14. They're stinky. He's a stinky teenager, and my other's are older than that. So they don't run up to me like a three- or four-year-old saying, Daddy, hold me. This is the posture that Paul is encouraging men to, to arrive at. Now, does it have to be a posture of physical hands up? I think Paul is encouraging us to do that because the physical should show the heart. But the attitude Paul wants is the attitude that he's encouraging all men to have. So if you're a hand raiser, great. If you're not a hand raiser, I, I think Paul is encouraging all of us to be. But if you're not, is your heart in a posture of humility saying, Daddy, Father, Abba, Father, hold me. That's the posture of the heart that Paul is encouraging here. The issue is, is my heart humble? Now, it's interesting, Paul makes a second, excuse me, Paul is making a second point to make sure we understand how our hands are to be raised, and he emphasizes the heart in stating without anger or quarreling. Men, do you think Paul knows this? I think he does. He's a man, duh, but he knows how men are, and he knows it's easy for us to get bent out of shape in a hurry, to get angry, which leads to other things like arrogance, pride, then control, and all other kinds of spiritual issues that come out of anger. The word for anger that Paul uses here literally means to let anger grow and build inside of a person. So I want you to think of a fire that just started, then you add a little more wood, You add a little bit bigger pieces, and before you know it, it's growing and it's a raging fire. That's the symbolism that Paul is using here for this word. Without anger, and then he says quarreling. The the word he's using for quarreling, dissension, means to plot and calculate. It's quarreling or dissension, and it means to plot or calculate. In other words, Paul is saying... uh, that people, that men specifically, who are angry and quarreling, they are planning out an angry response to another person's actions. 
So when you pray, when you worship, when we get to worship together, whether it's your church that's not FEC Port A, or it's right here at FEC Port A, men specifically, are we meeting but still angry about something, angry towards someone who's done something to us, or maybe they don't even know that they've done something, but you're angry about it. This brings to my mind, I don't know about you, but it brings to my mind something Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, 23 through 24. So if you are offering a gift, your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, Leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. Paul and Jesus are using different terminology, but they're addressing the heart. If there's something going on, then Paul and Jesus are encouraging us to deal with it, then come back and pray, worship, worship together, but deal with the issue. If you're bent out of shape, if you're angry, if you're wanting to create a raging fire in your heart, you feel it growing, Jesus says, stop. Deal with it with the other person. Paul says, don't worship angry and quarreling. Okay, ladies, I gave you a break. Now it's your turn. Are you ready? Well, the rest of this passage we're reading is addressed to you, but let's listen to how the Life Application Study Bible really paraphrases and puts this into proper context. So let's provide the context to this. To understand these verses, we need to understand the situation in which Paul and Timothy worked in first century Jewish culture. Women were not allowed to study. So let me pause from the Life Application Study Bible. Let's understand this, ladies. Ladies, did, women didn't go to school. Girls didn't go to school. They could not learn in a sit-down, understand-me-what-I'm-saying type setting. That was not part of the culture. So now Paul says, let women learn, and he talks about an attitude of the heart. But now this is something new and different. This actually, at the time, lit some of the people on fire like, what? Women, learn, are you kidding me? This was controversial at the time. So this is a new freedom, something that women get to experience at this time. So we need to understand how Paul is addressing this, and he's encouraging the women of the church to learn. So let's continue with the Life Application Study Bible. When Paul said that the women should learn quietly and submissively, he was offering them an amazing new opportunity to learn God's Word. They were not, excuse me, they were to listen and learn quietly and submissively. Refer, that those words referred to an attitude of quietness and composure, not total silence, ladies. In addition... Paul himself acknowledges that women publicly prayed and prophesied. We see that in 1 Corinthians 11.5. So Paul is not against women speaking up or speaking out as long as they know what they're talking about. They've been educated in Scripture. They know what, what they're trying to say is from God and not just something off the top of their head. The problem at this time was that women in the Ephesian church were abusing their newly acquired freedom. Because these women were new converts, they did not have the necessary experience, knowledge, or Christian maturity to teach those who already had extensive scriptural education. Some women were teaching but did not understand or know what they were saying. So what, what's Paul really saying? This I just finished the Life Application Study Bible paraphrase of the culture there. In other words, Paul is saying, ladies... Learn and grow, then teach. And this isn't just applicable to women. We'll get to that later on. But this is really across the board. It's a principle that he was addressing to the ladies in the Ephesian church because the ladies in the Ephesian church that were new converts, they were coming out of other religions, specifically Roman temple prostitution, was a big player in this. So the ladies were coming out of that and they were experiencing 
the Holy Spirit inside of them. They were experiencing a freedom, and it really invigorated them, but they were saying things that they didn't understand and didn't know what they were talking about. So Paul is saying, hold on, ladies. Let's learn. Let's grow. Let the Holy Spirit teach you, and then you can teach others. So let's look at this in verses 9 and 10. Likewise also, that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire, but with what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. So now that we understand the context, we understand why Paul is using this verbiage here and these words because these women were coming out of other situations where it didn't matter what they were wearing, if they were wearing anything. Now he is saying, let's adorn ourselves with proper apparel. And he uses that word adorn, which means to put to order or decorate. So this is a continuation, as I said earlier, this is a continuation of this topic of prayer and now corporate worship. As we went through verses 1 through 7 last week, understanding that we men and women are to pray for all people. Paul then tells men to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or quarreling. Now Paul is stressing how women are to pray and how they are to worship and learn. This is a, there is a cultural component here, but let's not get caught up in a culture 2,000 years ago. Let's see and ask the Holy Spirit, what do you want from me? How can I learn from this? both men and women. Now, let's address something. It's not wrong or anti-Scripture to want to be attractive and to want to be handsome if you're a man. There's nothing wrong with that. There is something ingrained in here where Paul is actually trying to teach a, a godly femininity and a godly masculinity in these verses here. And we could get caught up and we could really address a whole lot of things. For a long time, the church has not addressed same-sex attraction. And Paul actually isn't talking about it here, but this can go into that if we dig into and we allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us. So whether Paul is addressing women coming out of prostitution or this could apply to other issues like same-sex attraction where what, what we are to do is say, okay, Holy Spirit, would you speak to me? You see, God saves us where we're at. We can't get clean, then come to God. So listen to me. If you're listening online, and maybe you've been struggling with same-sex attraction, the Holy Spirit knows. God knows exactly where you're at. He does not condemn you. Listen carefully. If you're a believer, if you've asked Jesus into your life, You are bought and paid for with the blood of Christ. Sin has been paid for, regardless of that sin. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, if you have a relationship with Him, you are not condemned. But if you're a believer who's struggling, either with trying to be attractive to the opposite gender, or you're struggling with same-sex attraction, God loves you, and He wants you to focus on Him. God will heal the wounds that have been there. There may be counseling. There may be all kinds of things that need to be involved in that. But listen to me. God meets us where we're at. You don't have to come clean and to get yourself all straight and tidy before you come to God. Because you can't. We can't. There's no way we could. So, felt the Holy Spirit saying I needed to address something that really isn't talked about here, but it could apply. So let's go into this again. It's not wrong to want to be attractive for for the opposite gender. The question, though, is to what degree should women and men, men, there is application here, to take this advice about our outward appearance. Paul specifically addresses women fixing their hair, wearing gold, pearls, and expensive clothes. But men, we often can take this to a different level as well, whether it's church, out 
outside in other places and try to look all buff and tan and all this other stuff to try to be attractive for, our, for the opposite sex. And our heart may be in the complete wrong place here. So there is a cross-the-board issue here for all of us. If we're trying to draw attention from others and not focus on Jesus, then we need to check our heart and allow the Holy Spirit to change our heart. Paul was not prohibiting these things. He was simply saying that women should not be drawing attention to themselves through these things. He's saying, let the Holy Spirit shine through you. Let's learn. Let's grow. It's okay to want to be attractive and to, to have that desire, but what is the purpose? That's what Paul is trying to get at here. He uses the words modesty and decency. Those are the key words. All men and women would do well to remember that godly femininity and godly masculinity are really an effort that the Holy Spirit does. It's not something that we can conjure up. And so we ask the Holy Spirit, would you speak to my heart here? The general rule for both men and women emphasizes that both behavior and dress must express submission to and respect for Jesus Christ. Let me say that again. I think that's important for us to grab onto. The general rule for both men and women emphasizes that, beha- that both behavior and dress must express submission to and respect for Jesus Christ. Paul did not want the Ephesian women to teach because they didn't yet have enough knowledge or experience. That's what he's getting at. These were new, newly converted women who had come out of all kinds of situations. And Paul says, let's learn and grow. The Ephesian church had a particular problem with false teachers. We addressed that in chapter 1. Evidently, the women were especially susceptible to the false teachings because they did not yet have a scriptural basis and knowledge to discern the truth. In addition, some of the women were apparently flaunting their newfound Christian freedom by wearing inappropriate clothing. Paul was telling Timothy not to put anyone, in this specific case women, into a position of leader or leadership who is not yet mature in the faith. And this same principle applies to us today. And when we get to 1 Timothy chapter 3, we're going to look at some qualities of leadership in two different offices of the church. And these are things that we all want to grow and say, Holy Spirit, would you work in me? Grow these attitudes and attributes in my heart, not so that I can lead people, but so that you are glorified. So Paul is saying there is a a principle here that is universal. That no one, men or women, should be in a leadership position if they are not mature enough in their faith. Leadership, and especially teaching, preaching, is a heavy burden. See, James, the brother of Jesus, acknowledges this in James chapter 3, verse 1. He says, not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. There is a heaviness to church leadership, and especially teaching and preaching. It's not a, it doesn't have to be a burden, but there is a heavier connotation to it because we can lead people to Jesus or we can lead people astray. And you look at Paul... His writings, you look at John, especially in 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and then Peter, 1st, 2nd Peter, they address false teachers. And especially 2nd Peter, uh, Peter chapter 2, read that and see what Peter says to false teachers. That will set your hair on fire. It will make you not want to teach is what it will do. So we don't simply speak words. If you're teaching, preaching the gospel, teaching from God's word, we don't just speak words. We want to teach from the heart what the Spirit has already grown inside of us. So I said just a second ago, the universal truth is that 
Uh, those who want to be in leadership, they don't need to be in leadership positions if they're not mature enough. So what is mature enough? What's the gauge on that? Well, one aspect of it is for us to be able to look at one's own heart and discern whether or not he or she is trying to grab attention selfishly or desiring to put the attention on Jesus. When small groups meet, when uh, you hear a a pastor like me or other teachers get up and expound from the Word of God, are they trying to draw attention to themselves or trying to put the focus on Jesus? So, verses 13 and 15, 13 through 15, Paul uses the analogy of Adam and Eve. And it's almost as if he's saying, Adam didn't eat anything, but that actually isn't what he's saying here. Because we read Genesis chapter 2 we, uh, and 3, uh, Genesis chapter 3, first part of it. And we see Eve, yes, Eve takes the fruit, whatever it is, she eats, but she hands it to Adam. Why Adam didn't speak up before then, men, I don't understand. Hey, but Adam was right there, so we know he ate. We know he uh, followed along. So what is Paul trying to do here? This could cause some consternation and churning of the stomach because both Adam and Eve sinned. What is Paul trying to communicate? Well, not all theologians agree, but I believe personally that Paul is communicating here the issue of false teachers and who was actually being led astray with the false teachers. As I said earlier, we had, uh, in the Ephesian church, they had women come into the church who were recently converted to Christianity. As Jesus came into their life, they were experienced of freedom, and then they heard some false teachers. And by the way, they were probably men teaching uh, wrong things, and they were leading these new, newly converted women in the wrong direction. So what I believe Paul is trying to get at is ladies, specifically, what he's saying here to the Ephesian ladies is let's learn in a quieter, more humble position and let's learn the gospel. Let's learn the truth of who Jesus is. Far too often pastors, teachers, and theologians have used these verses to prohibit and divide the church. And If you hear how Paul is saying these things, that is not what he's trying to do at all. Matter of fact, he's trying to unify the body for the purpose of Jesus. You and I should be able to see that Paul is wanting the members to put their focus on the Father and grow up in Christ, not put attention onto themselves. That's what Paul is trying to avoid. So here's our bottom line. And I realize this is kind of an in-the-weeds type topic here, but there is application to us and for us. The Father wants our attention to be on Himself and His work in us. So whether it is someone up here teaching or it's someone else in a small group or any aspect, if you're in your group singing worship songs, Lifting up holy hands without anger and dissension or quarreling. The issue is, what's my heart? Am I trying to get attention or am I trying to put attention on the Father? Verse 8, I desire then that in every place the men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. I would simply invite you, to pray this prayer with me. Father, you want your church to grow to be like Jesus. Help me to allow Jesus to work in me while I put the focus on who you are in me. And that's the core issue. Father, help me to put the focus on Jesus, not on me. So, as I introduce this, I want to say it again. Let's not get caught up in the culture, but let's get caught up in the principle, the point that Paul is making, the Holy Spirit is really speaking to us. Where's my heart? Men, are you allowing anger and quarreling to build? Have you 
tried and even attempted to settle matters with the brother or sister, whoever it is that you're struggling with. Ladies, are you trying to draw attention to yourself, whether it's through clothing or or ornamentation or whatever else the issue might be? There, There are many other ways to try to draw attention. This is just the issue Paul is addressing here. So what's our heart? You see, this is what it means in search of church. That's kind of the subtitle of what we're looking at in this series. And Paul wants the church, the church at large, the the universal church, he wants the church to be about Jesus, not about individuals, not about this, that, this specific tangent. He wants the church to be about Jesus. And so that needs to be our heart. Would you join me in prayer? Father, your word applies to us every day. Your spirit speaks to your word, through your word, and speaks to our heart. So Father, if anyone, male or female, is dealing with anger and quarreling, I ask that your spirit would speak and give courage to go and make things right or to settle the matter, whatever the issue is, and not allow anger to turn into a raging fire. And Father, I pray for all believers as well in our attitude toward our appearance, that it would not be an issue of trying to get attention but rather us trying to put attention onto Jesus and who He is in us. Father, thank You that You care so much for us individually and You care for Your church. You care for the church and You care for us just as much as an individual person. Father, thank You for loving us. Thank You for for saving us because of Jesus and who He is. And we get this freedom in Christ. So, Father, help us to use this freedom for the cause and purpose of Jesus. It's in His name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us this morning. My prayer is that God speaks to you and that because of God speaking, you are able to go out or (laughs) if you're not able to go out and be next to someone, at least to speak the truth of what God has spoken to you and allow Jesus to shine through you. Thank you for tuning in. We'll see you this week.